Geez, General, I thought they were all here for me, but I guess they were here for you. <laughs> well, good morning, NACO. Good morning. And good morning to General Powell. We are so honored to have you here. Are you, are you ready to shoot some pool? Fast Eddie, I'm ready. Fast Eddie. I'm so, just delighted to be here with this great association, and I thank you for inviting me. And so pleased that you're looking forward to leadership development as part of your program. Well, we are honored to have the general here, and we are here to focus on his book, It Worked For Me, which is a key part of the NACO High Performance Leadership Academy that we've partnered with the general and the Professional Development Academy. And we've put over 1,200 county officials through it in the first year. We've had 20% of counties, and it's really based on your life. And what we really want to talk about is you grew up as a young boy in the Bronx, a Jamaican immigrant family and parents who rose to the highest levels. And what I mean by that is he danced with Princess Diana. <laughs> so can you give us some insights into your early years and how it really shaped your instincts and your drive as a leader? Yeah, I was born in Harlem and uh, raised in Harlem and the South Bronx section of New York, one of the worst sections of New York. Uh, but I was blessed with uh, two immigrant parents who were just wonderful. And uh, they made it clear that even though I was not the brightest kid in the family, uh, it was expected that I would do my very best to get an education. And in the family, they didn't care so much if you studied to be a doctor or a lawyer, as long as you were getting an education. And what they kept pushing at us is that we came to this country to do better. And so we have expectations of you. We expect you to not do anything that insults the family. Uh, and so do your best and take advantage of the opportunities this country gave you. And then the second thing is do not shame the family. This was a big deal in my family. And I lived in the South Bronx, and almost in every other apartment building, there was an aunt who hung out the window all day long looking at all the kids. <laughs> you know. And I mean, you'd, you'd just look, and they were looking down on you, and if you ever screwed up, they'd be right down on top of you. They wouldn't wait for parents to come home. They'd come down and beat you up themselves. Um, and uh, I, I, I've talked about this many, many times, and the point I like to make is, you know, back in the South Bronx, we had the aunt net, which is a lot faster than the internet is today. <laughs> <laughs> you all had aunts. You all had aunts like that. It's, it's, it's. So your first name has, I think you were destined for great military greatness with your first name. Why don't you tell the folks where it comes from? I uh, was baptized as Colin Powell. And uh, I grew up as a child with that name, Colin Powell. But then when I rose in rank, and uh, even before I rose in rank, there was a hero out of World War II um, who uh, took on the Japanese. He was a naval aviator, an aviator. Uh, and he died in the process of attacking the Japanese fleet. And President Roosevelt wanted to honor him. And so he told the family of the young man, when your young man, the little boy, grows up to be an adult, I will let him go to West Point, and um, that's what we're going to do. He automatically can go to West Point, uh, except that his name was pronounced Colin. It's an Irish variant of the two. And so uh, I went with both. My friends would call me uh, Colin, and my relatives would call me Colin. Didn't bother me any. But then I became national security advisor to President Reagan, and all the reporters came in and said, you got to pick one. <laughs> you can't go around confused. Pick one. And I said, well, I have more friends than relatives, so let's go with Colin. Um, that was a bit of a mistake, because it really should be Colin, but I like Colin. <laughs> well, since you mentioned President Reagan, what I discovered when we last met was you had another career path, and that was as a per, an impersonator. So can you tell us one of your best Ronald Reagan stories, but using his voice? Can you do that for us? Well, I'll try. Um, <laughs> when I was his national security advisor for the last year of his administration, 
and the year before that I was Deputy National Security Advisor. But every morning I would go in to see uh, President Reagan and we'd go over the events of the day or what's coming up tomorrow, what we did yesterday. And I became very close to him. He was a rather unique individual. And so we, we became the best of friends. But one morning I went in there and uh, I was working on a terrible problem. It was a fight between the State Department, Defense Department, the trade rep, all kinds of people were in this argument. And I was telling the president, now, Mr. President, this is terrible. We've got to get it fixed. We've got to do something soon, sir. And he was paying absolutely no attention to me whatsoever. And so, you know, I talk, I talk louder, I talk faster, and, you know, nothing. He kept looking over my shoulder out into the Rose Garden outside of the Oval Office. And I, I couldn't understand. He was ignoring me. And so I just kept going. And then finally I realized, uh, you, you got to get out of here. You don't know what's going on anymore. And just as I thought to get up and go, he suddenly jumped and said, Colin, Colin, look, look, look. The squirrels came and got the nuts I put out there this morning. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, Mr. President, I see that. And um, I do got to go now. <laughs> So I went back to my wonderful office in the northwest corner of the White House, and I sat there saying to myself, what the devil was that all about? What happened? And then it hit me. It was something I knew all along, and it practiced. But this one incident, this one moment with Reagan, crystallized the whole theory for me. Because what he was saying to me by, uh, uh, I'm out watching you know, the squirrels in the Rose Garden, what he was saying to me is, Colin, I love you, and I'll sit here for as long as you want me to, as you tell me about your problem. <laughs> but until you give me a problem, I'm going to watch the squirrels in the Rose Garden. <laughs> and so it just dawned on me, that's what he was really saying, and I never forgot it. And in all my subsequent assignments as National Security Advisor or as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or as Secretary of State, I always gave my line subordinates, guys right below me, my senior leaders, a range of behavior within which they were responsible. And I told them so. And I made it clear to them, here's what I expect of you, and your range of opinion and decision is this wide. Or it might be this wide. Everybody's different. Every human being is different. And so I had to tailor it to their capabilities and their shortcomings. And we all have shortcomings. But I never forgot that when I did that, what I did was what Reagan did with me. He was essentially saying to me, Colin, I trust you. I trust you to take care of this. And so from then on in, whenever I talked to my subordinates, each one of them knew what trust level I had in them. And they executed on that, and they were proud to do so. And so when you trust your people, guess what happens? They trust you. And that's part of leadership, building bonds of trust within an organization so that it goes both ways, one team, one fight. We're all in this together. Uh, and I've never forgotten that, and I've practiced it for the rest of my life. But I also learned it not when I was National Security Advisor, when I was a young lieutenant in the Army for the first time. I got into the Army because um, I was going through college and I was not a very good student. Uh, in fact, I was a very mediocre student, and I can prove it. I have, I have the report card. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to, you know, get by. Uh, and then after about six or eight months in my college life, I found ROTC. Uh, and I said, let me try this. And I did, and I joined a fraternity with an ROTC. Um, and ROTC, they didn't play with you. You can't be mediocre in the Army. You've got to be your best, the best. And so that really turned me on. I got straight A's for four, four years in ROTC. I became the commander of the ROCC detachment at City College of Indoor. And from there, I went into the Army as a young second lieutenant, immigrant family, raised in the Bronx, black kid, still had segregation in the country at that point. We were just coming out of it in the Army. Uh, and as my sergeants pushed me and told me when I was this young lieutenant, Lieutenant Powell, 
We don't care if you're an immigrant kid or not. We don't care if you're black, white, blue, or yellow. We don't care where you grew up. We don't care that you went to a public school and you didn't go to West Point. The only thing we care about now is do you perform? Do you do your very, very best? And do you have potential? And that's what promotion and going further means, performance and potential. And so they said, that's all we care about. And so give us no excuses. You just perform, and if you demonstrate potential, you're going up. And that's what I did for the next uh, 35 years. And um, I don't know, one day they made me chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I said, damn. <laughs> <laughs> But I never expected that, and I never sought after it. I just did the best I could at every position they ever gave me, and I excelled to their you know, astonishment. Um, but I excelled, um, and I just kept moving up. And then when I became national security advisor to the president, I was also sort of the national security advisor to the vice president, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. We were both uh, next to each other in the west wing of the White House. And there was only one bathroom. We shared a bathroom. <laughs> and I became chairman <laughs> of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. <laughs> but we just became very, very close. And um, I was privileged to be asked by President Bush 41 to, you know, to be chairman. But what he, what he communicated to me through our boss, my boss, Dick Cheney, who was Secretary of Defense, um, the president told Mr. Cheney two questions to ask Colin before we give him the job. One, does he think he can do it? You never ask an infantry officer if you can do something. He can, no question about it. And second, I was a junior four-star in the armed forces, junior to everybody else, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps. Uh, and so the president asked Dick to check on this and see if, change, if I thought I would have any problem with all those who were senior to me, and I was gonna become senior to all of them. And I said to Mr. Cheney, we're professionals. We know what we're supposed to do, and there would be no problem. And there wasn't. Uh, within 24 hours, every one of the other 14 four stars called and said, Colin, tell us what we have to do. Uh, and so that was uh, my career in a nutshell. But what it amounted to was do your very, very best Take risks, never deceive your people, just privates. I might try to snow another general or some colonel. <laughs> well, don't ever screw with the privates because they can, they can smell you in a heartbeat. And so I always knew that my responsibility was to take care of the soldiers the American people had entrusted to my care. And everything I did in my career as an officer focused on the privates, the ensigns, the junior people, um, and that was my life. Be before we get into your 13 rules, because we want to hear that story, w you brought it up a little bit earlier, but you have rules for your aides. And one of the things I want to make sure everybody knows is one of his rules for his aides is don't ever sign my name. So this gentleman actually signed 3,000 books for us by hand. And so talk to us about it because these are elected officials or executives who all have staff and you are so focused on clarity of purpose and a shared mission Walk us through a little bit your rules for your aides. Whenever I moved into a new position, you know, you have aides who help you. And the more senior you became, the more aides you have. And I wanted to make sure that we got off to a good start and we didn't waste time. So I had these rules. And I would give every one of my aides a rule card. And the rule card essentially says things like, don't ever sign my name to anything. Don't ever have anybody come to my house and spend any government money fixing anything, no matter what my wife says. You know? <laughs> uh, and it was just, and uh, never fail to tell me something I need to know. Don't hide anything from me. We're all in this together. And so 
when anything is going wrong, tell me about it. I'm not going to chew you out. We're going to solve it. And so I had to speed up the process of coming together with my assistants. And it usually worked pretty well. They, they, they were annoyed by it sometimes. And I used to tell them, in these first weeks together, you'll do things that I'm not going to like or I want to change. I will send you a note about it. Don't get mad. We're just trying to speed up the process. They hated it. Uh, but after two weeks, we were a team. And I always wanted a close-knit team that took care of me. And I took care of them, and they understood that. But I also had another staff that was not a real staff. These are my closest friends outside the government. And they all had a phone number that was on my desk. The phone was on my desk. And only they could, only I could pick up the phone. My assistants and other people in the staff do never touch that phone. It's for me and it's for my buddies outside, about five or six buddies. And these were close friends. They were not in government. They were not in the military. But they knew me well enough and I knew them well enough that when they saw me do something that was wrong or, you know, hey, Cola, you know, you really screwed up that hearing the other day. None of your people are going to tell you that, but your friends will tell you that. Or it, it could be very trivial. Colin, I saw you on television the other day. You need a haircut. <laughs> okay? And it, it worked. You have to have somebody who will tell you that you're screwing up or that you've done well. And I've run into so many people who are leaders but can't stand anybody telling them they did something wrong. But you've got to have somebody like that or else you're going to screw up at one point or another. And I always had trusted agents who would either call me or come see me and tell me what I had done wrong because I do a lot wrong. It always reminds me of a, a, a girl in a Japanese high school. And I was talking to the students and there were a group of A, a students, A-list students, and they had all their cards filled out with a question they had to ask. But that was boring. So I asked, anybody in the room want to ask me anything? And this young lady in the back of the room stands up and said, and she looked very, very troubled. She said, are you ever afraid? Have you ever failed at anything? And so I thought quickly, wondering what was in her mind or what was troubling her. I said, uh, I'm afraid regularly. And I'll never forget the first day that I got shot at, and the guy in front of me was killed. Uh, and I knew that we were going to wake up the next morning and face the same enemy. That was fear. But what did I do? You have to control your fear. And all of us have different levels of fear. You have to learn to control it. And I said, did I ever fail at anything? I probably failed at something every single day. But failure is part of life. Don't think you can go through life without failing at anything. The question is, what do you do about it? And my answer always has been for decades now, Examine the failure, where did it go wrong? But most importantly, what did I do wrong? What did I forget to do? We didn't check on. And then maybe I'll fix the team. But I always accept the failure as something that I failed to do. But once I've fixed it, I take the failure, I roll it up into a little ball, I throw it over my shoulder, and I never want to see it again. How many of you have to live with somebody or you've been touch, touched by somebody who wants to tell you about something that went wrong 20 years ago? I don't care, you know? <laughs> Why do I care what went wrong 20 years ago? Live for the day, live for tomorrow. You know, this is part of life. And if you are afraid of failure, you're gonna be in trouble. So I failed many times, and there's a record of this, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, the newspapers have always found something I did wrong. Um, and it made me mad, but that's part of life. But you've got to learn to move on and remember that your, your life is not spent because you had one failure. It's just beginning because you've learned something about yourself. So when, when you're in public life or public office, it's really hard to have balance in your life. People are always pulling at you, and I'm amazed how much you spend with your family, but also your Volvos. He is a car nut. So tell us, you did have a failure driving a Pepsi truck, which got you promoted. Was that the start of your love for 
automobiles. Where does that come from? Um, I love cars, and uh, my, my father, with his small salary, was able to buy a Pont, 1953 Pontiac. And I loved it at the time. So I had a thing about cars. And then I fell in love with Volvos, old Volvos, 122s and 144s. And even as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I would spend my weekends fixing old Volvos. My driver would go find a dead one somewhere, pull it on post, uh, and then I'd get under it. And people, why? I said, because when I have a car like that, I can analyze it. And I can figure out what, if, what is wrong. And I'll find two or three things that are wrong, and then I analyze that to see what is the issue. And then I fix that. And if it starts up, wow, what a great day. I succeeded. But the government doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, you're just confused. <laughs> um, now, so I, I, I must have fixed and sold 30 Volvos while I was chairman. Because I would fix them, take them down to Earl Scheib, get an $89 paint job on them, and sell them as fast as I could. I didn't want to keep them around much longer after I fixed them. You know, somebody else can have it. And um, but I'm not in the Volvos anymore because my, my wife would not let me um, fix cars in our garage of our new home. And so I moved to Corvettes. <laughs> I've, I've had several Corvettes now ever since I drove one at the pace as a pace car at Indianapolis, Indiana, Indianapolis 500. Um, and about three years ago, we were going to a Christmas party at my son's condo down in Old Town, Alexandria. And it was in a, Volvo, in a, a Corvette that was about two years old, but it was a new model. It was cool. And so we drove to my son's garage. We pulled into the garage, and there was a brand new Corvette waiting. And my kids and grandkids were all over the new one with a ribbon on it and everything. And they said, here it is, Grandpa. We got you a new Corvette. I said, but I didn't really need one. That's all right. You got one. Uh, and I said, well, isn't that wonderful? And so my son, who is a very successful lawyer, uh, said, it's all yours. It's all yours, Poppy. And, um, and everybody was cheering. And I, I was so deeply touched that my children had done this for me. And on Tuesday morning, they sent me the damn bill. <laughs> so I called my son. I said, come here, Mike. <laughs> what the hell this, how does this happen? I didn't want a new Corvette. You guys bought one, and I got to pay for it? We knew you were going to buy one anyway. <laughs> that's it. That's it. But how do, we, how do we keep all this together? We, one of the important things in, in our life with the Fowler family in all that we've gone through, um, I was hurt both times I went to Vietnam, telegrams to my wife. My son was almost killed as a young lieutenant in Germany, but he's recovered, became a lawyer, and a very successful lawyer. Uh, so you have these issues that will come your way. But in our family, um, we were one family, a uh, great family, but we kept what I do in the military separate from what Alma does in the house. I own the army, she owns the house. And it's worked for many, many years. Uh, she didn't want to marry me initially because when I was going to Vietnam on the first tour, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to be going away. We're just dating at that point. And uh, I said, she said, how long are you going to be gone? I said, a year. Uh, I hope you'll write me every day. She said, no. What do you mean, no? She said, we're both 25. If this is all I mean to you, um, let's end it now. Oh, my God. So I drove back to my base at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. She was in the Boston Guild for the Hard of Hearing. She's an audiologist. And so the next night I drove back in and said, you know, well, OK. Uh, uh, will, you, will you marry me now? Uh, you know, right when you get time, you know? <laughs> so she agreed to it, and we got married 11 days later. Her, her father was not happy. Um, we got married 11 days later, and that was 58 years ago, and we're still married. Wow. 
So before we do run out of time, I do want to get to your 13 rules. So, and they are all in the book, and we encourage you to use them. The book has so many lessons that are really concise and powerful. And I think I've used all 13 rules planning this conference. So can, tell us how you came up with them and what they mean to well, you. Well, they're not really rules. They're, they're little sayings that I clipped out of the papers or somewhere, <clears throat> or something that had gone wrong in my life. And I wrote a little note about it and put it on a glass on my desk. <clears throat> It was 1989, excuse me, <clears throat> and um, I had just made four stars, and I was in Atlanta, Georgia, commanding the Forces Command. And there was a reporter from Parade Magazine. You're all familiar with that Sunday magazine. And he was writing an article about me becoming a four-star general. Um, and so he wanted a hook for the ending of it. So he went to my, one of my assistants and said, give me something about the general. You know, and so they said, look, go look at his desk and you'll see all these little sayings on it. And go ask him about those. What, why, why does he do it? So he sure enough asked me, um, tell me about these sayings you've got under your desk glass. So we talked about it for a minute. He says, well, why don't you give me some of them so I could put it in the article? And so I said, ah, you to, come on, these are just little things I wrote down. He said, come on, give me 13 of them. And so I, I gave him 13 of the clean ones. <laughs> <laughs> and he he put him in the book after it was in the article it was in my first book it's in my second book and we have we have printed these by the thousands because people want to see them but they're not so much rules they're just little things you should think about which I thought about and there was no logic to them there was just 13 things that I gave him but it turns out there is a certain logic to him. And just to illustrate the logic, rule number one is, it ain't as bad as it looks, it'll look better in the morning. It ain't as bad as it looks, it'll look better in the morning. It's not a given. It may not look better in the morning, it may look worse in the morning. But it's an attitude that I have, and it's an attitude I want everybody around me to have. <clears throat> we can fix any problem. It'll look better in the morning. And you'll see how the, it's expanded more than that in the, uh, in the book that you now have. The 13 rules are explained in the first chapter. And then rule number four was, it can be done, which is kind of like the first rule. It can be done. Always believe it can be done. And then rule number 13 <clears throat> is, uh, <clears throat> says um, perpetual optimism is a force multiplier, meaning if you always believe, if you always have confidence, if you've trained your people, if they trust you, you trust them, and you're one team, you're one fight, another rule, then your optimism will fuel the whole organization so that they will always believe that they are capable of doing any job you put in front of them. And perpetual optimism gives you more power than just what it seems you have. And it's a military term, perpetual optimism, is a force multiplier. It makes your force more powerful than it might seem to others because of the optimism you have to lead, and that comes from, it can be done, comes from, it'll be better in the morning. But better in the morning is an attitude. Um, so that's that one. Those are the three I like the most. So in your, your book has so many great stories and it was hard to pick, but you have one where you write, to the world, you may be one person but to one person, you may be the world. Yeah. And you talk about the State Department parking garage attendant, and I think you're be kind to everybody regardless of title. Can you expand on that a little bit? I like to wander around my office and around my organization. I did it when I was a, a brigade commander in the 101st Airborne Division. I would wander around. Nobody ever knew where I might be. Except on Thursday, they knew I would follow a specific route so that any private could stop me and tell me what's on their mind. Uh, and so I think it's very important to wander around. So I became Secretary of State, and I used to wander around the building. And uh, one day I got bored, really bored, and I had a private elevator that would get me downstairs with not anybody seeing it. And I was wandering around the garage, seeing how, how did they get all the cars in there every morning? Um, and so I'm wandering around the garage, and it's run by contract employees. 
They're all immigrants. Of course, they're immigrants. And so uh, they see me, and they, oh my, oh my God. So they come on over, and they say, General Powell, Mr. Secretary, are you lost? Can we help you get back upstairs? I said, I said no, I just want to see you guys. You want to see us? Yeah. Where are you from, Honduras? Where are you from, Ghana? How long have you been here? A couple, couple weeks now, a year or two. Good job? Yes, sir. Too much carbon monoxide down here, are you guys okay? He said, sir, we're fine. I said, you have to park the cars in sequence, one, two, and three. And car number two and three can't leave until one leaves and makes you know, opportunity for two and three to leave. So isn't that hard? Yeah, yes, sir, it takes some work. Well, tell me, how do you decide every morning who's number one, who's number two, and who's number three? And they stood, looked at each other and get a little nervous. Mr. Secretary kind of goes like this. If when you pull in in the morning, you stop by us, us immigrant parkers, and you lower the window, and you say, good morning, how are you? Everything okay? You're number one. <laughs> it's, it's, it's as simple as that. You're number one. Because you saw another human being. He was an immigrant, only been in this country a short time. He's trying to get ahead. He's got kids. His kids are going to go further than he has gone in this great country of ours. But you stopped, and you said to him, good morning, how are you? And it's reciprocated. Because in that moment, you and the guy outside, the parker, have made themselves equal, the same. The driver of the car is an assistant secretary, whoopee. Guy outside is just a parker. But in that moment, you're two human beings who care about each other. Neither one of you can get your job done without the other one doing the job also. And so I've always drilled this into the people who work for me. There is no such thing as an employee who is worthless. If you have one of those, get rid of the individual. What you have to do is see everybody at part of the day equal to you. You may be a four-star general. You may be a secretary of state. But in that moment, good morning, how are you? You're just two human beings who care about each other. And that's the way you should go through life running an organization. You care about them, they care about you. It'll make a great organization. So before we get to Q&A, we're gonna do a few minutes of Q&A. You may not care about this group as much that I'm going to ask you about. So, in your book, how do you, you know? You give lessons about how you deal with the media. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you you talk. No, there's only one thing you have to think about: how do I reload this gun? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, okay. no, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, so, but all in all seriousness, you you outline five audiences that you thought about when you were doing a media interview. And I think since these are elected officials who deal with the media all the time, it's so natural to think about you're talking to the reporter. Yeah. But you outline a totally different perspective. It's slightly different in that there are some rules that I've always followed. First, remember that the reporter is asking you the question. But it's not the reporter you're answering to. You're answering to who he is talking to. And so don't ever get trapped by a reporter into thinking that the reporter is your audience. The real audience is the people who are listening, who are watching, and never forget that. Second, remember that you are also talking to the American people. The American people who have entrusted those soldiers to your care. And you always have to remember that they are watching, and it's their sons and daughters who are at risk of dying, being killed. And so when a reporter says to you, well, General, when is the battle going to start? I ain't going to tell you. I got to watch out for those kids. They'll never do anything to put them to risk or at risk. <laughs> the third one. <clears throat> an another one had to do with the enemy. The enemy is watching television. 
So you can play to them. You can make them unhappy or uncomfortable. So there are ways of dealing with the people who are watching you who are the enemy you're going to fight. We used to do that all the time with uh, Iraqis and Somalians and, and, and issues like that. The next one is you are the head of a great alliance. And so as you are talking to the world, remember you are talking to the world. And every country out there that has soldiers in your group who are fighting with you, they're watching, they're listening. And this was most vivid when we had Desert Storm and General Schwarzkopf had troops from about 40 different countries. And I, when I was speaking, or Norm, when he was speaking, had to remember that all 40 of these countries had troops at risk. They had families. And so always be sensitive to what they're hearing, and not just what you're saying, but what they are hearing. And then the last rule, which is the most important one to me, the troops are watching. These young men and women who volunteered to serve their country, they're the ones who are going to live or die because of what you do. And so always speak in a manner that appeals to them so that they know that you are thinking about them and you're going to do everything you can to save them from being injured or killed and to give them the wherewithal to go win the war. Uh, and that's what you have to do. But you have to do these all at once. Uh, and this can be very tricky um, to measure you know, the, the balance between these different rules and how to talk to, to an audience. And uh, I've got a lot of experience about it, got better at it over time. When Desert Storm was going on, I had to put out some people to talk to the whole world. I had an intelligence officer who was great. Uh, he, he was just immediately into it. He looked like Wally Peepers. He looked very calm and quiet, and, and he did a great job. But then I had an operations officer, an Army three-star uh, by the name of Casey. And he always wanted to tell a reporter to get the hell out of here. And it took me a few days to explain to him that that is not the right answer or the right statement. Just smile. Glad you asked. And then answer the question. Um, and it, it, it took some learning on his part because he just wanted to curse him out. Uh, Norm, was very, Norm Schwarzkopf was very good at this. Big, tall Norm, you know, the bear. Uh, but he would occasionally drift away and we'd have to have a talk about it later that evening. <laughs> um, remember, I was a kid from the Bronx with immigrant parents. He came from a privileged family. He had lived in Iran for years as a child. And his father was head of the New Jersey police force. Uh, and they're the ones who rescued the, the Lindbergh or did the Lindbergh case. So it was a very prominent family. Uh, and Norm had been in the army longer than me. But it didn't make any difference. We were all one. And so these rules are for the purpose of making sure that you are speaking for the whole organization, the whole crowd. We are one. Sometimes you have to have to make sure this works. Norm and I spoke every night and every morning. We were eight hours difference. Uh, and we spoke honestly with each other. But there were one or two occasions when Norm forgot who the chairman was. And I'd have to remind him in vivid terms who the chairman was. Um, and it, it, it made for a little unpleasant moment, but didn't last long because the next day we were just professionals again, generals again, and we had work to do. And so I, even though I was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the, the senior person in the armed forces, I always treated my subordinates with the greatest respect. We have a guy in... Uh, Europe, who's the commander of all of our troops in Europe, the Supreme Allied Commander Europe. What a great title. Wonderful. Oh. And he was also, you know, four-star general in the American Army. And so when they went over there and became Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, they had a beautiful place to live. And it kind of went to their head. And I used to have constantly remind them. I said, you know, calm down. I know you think you're that you are the greatest guy in the world, you know, and I'm just pipping, you know. You're, you're, I'm just pipping, you know. But, but you just remember who's paying you every month. 
moi. You know, you may be Charlemagne today, and I'm Pippin, but tomorrow I either pay you or I don't, okay? That's fine. Well, we're probably going to run out of time before we get to, to Q&A, but I think the audience may want to know you. We're going to be talking about the coronavirus, and we have the CDC director coming today, and you have a special access to an island that Spain and Morocco dealt with, and you, you focus on being a problem solver. Talk to us about the problem solver, and tell us the story about this little island. It's called uh, Perea. It, uh, it's a small island off the coast of Morocco, about 200 yards off the coast of Morocco, but it belongs to Spain. And so one Saturday morning when I was minding my own business, the story broke that the Moroccans had invaded that island, which has no people on it, just feral goats. And nobody lives there, but they owned it. Um, and so the Moroccans took the island back from the Spaniards. And the Spaniards got mad, realized they'd lost their island. It took them about a week to realize they'd lost their island. <laughs> and so they attacked and took their island back. There were only 12 Moroccans on the island. That's all it took to take the island. And so the Spaniards took it back, but now they didn't know how to get off it without the Moroccans coming back. So the, the foreign minister of Spain calls me and said, what are you going to do about this situation? Huh? What are you talking about? Do you know what happened? Where? Out in the, you know, in the Mediterranean. And so I said, well, let me call you right back. I've got another call coming. So I called my, oh, what is she talking about? I don't know anything about an island. And so then they explained it to me. And I called her back and said, well, ma'am, uh, I understand the problem you're having with Morocco, but I don't understand what it has to do with me or the United States. You don't? Well, NATO supports us. Spain, and the African Union supports the Moroccans. And so we need you to solve it. <laughs> Ma'am, it's, it's a Saturday. I'm having a great time. <laughs> My grandkids are coming over to play in the pool. You've got to help us. This is an international crisis. So I start work on the problem. And I find out how it all happened, what's going on. And I came up with, with a solution. And I said, it's very easy to solve. Status quo ante bellum. We'll just go back to the way things were. And I can tell you that the Spaniards will not come back if the Moroccans leave, and the Moroccans will not come back if the Spanish leave. Oh, that's very good. Thank you very much. But now you have to write it up in an agreement. I have to write it up? I'm going to tell two foreign sovereign countries what they're supposed to be doing? Yes, OK. <laughs> so sitting, sitting at my home computer, I type up an agreement. Um, and uh, my lawyers are not around, so it's easy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I called them and I said, OK, look, I've got an agreement here, and I'm sending it out to you guys. Tell me if it's OK. And so the, the foreign minister of Spain, she came back. Um, and, and said uh, it's fine with her. Uh, and then the Moroccans came back and said, we can't agree to it because the king isn't here. And he's traveling somewhere, going to another city, and uh, we can't do anything until he approves it. I said, look, I got 30 minutes before the Spaniards are going to leave the deal. So find him and tell him I'm calling. I knew his father. I know him. And I'm sure he will take the call. Well, he doesn't have a phone in the car. Well, go find a phone. <laughs> and so about 10 minutes later, the call comes in. They must have found a 7-Eleven and you know, got a call. Saying, <laughs> it's His Majesty the King. I said, Your Majesty, uh, oh, Mr. Secretary, how are you? I'm very well, sir. But here's the deal. Here's what we have to do. We have to do it in the next 30 minutes. But unless you approve it, I can't do it. Uh, and he said, well, I haven't seen it, so how can I approve an agreement I've never seen? Good question. So I said to him is, your majesty, trust us for the United States. Trust me. I've known your country for many years, and you're one of the first countries that ever had diplomatic relations with the United States. So trust us. 
And he said, I trust you. And then we had a problem with the island. It has two different names, one for the Spanish and one for the Moroccans. And so and they said, well, we can't, we can't sign this because it's got a, two names. What do I do? It's Saturday afternoon. I want to go to the pool. <laughs> um, so I call my geographers, State Department geographers. Give me the exact location down to minutes and seconds. You know, and they did. They came back and they gave me the geographic location. Uh, whereupon everybody agreed, oh, I can't argue with that. And so I solved it. And then on Monday, my lawyers were saying, what the hell did you do, sir? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, who signed it? I signed it. <laughs> you know, somebody had to sign it, and I was the only one around. Um, the whole point, the reason the story's in the book is that I didn't have to do a thing. I didn't have to help either one of them. But it has always been my business and, and my policy and my way of thinking that you got to help somebody in need, whether you're obliged to or have a responsibility to or not. If somebody's counting on you, then you got to try to help them, whether it is in your interest or not. And that goes back to what he, what he said at the beginning of the story. And it, it has to do with a priest. In my church uh, in Virginia, many years ago, we took in a priest for a year who was having difficulties wherever he was. We didn't ask what his difficulties were. We just said we'd take him in. We told the bishop we'd take him in for a year, however, two years if you wanted to. And he stayed for about a year. And on his last Sunday, I'll never forget the day, he was giving a sermon. And then he closed the sermon by saying, always remember, the person that you are giving assistance to or help for needs it more than you will ever know. So always remember that it may seem like just a little something on your hand, your part, letting him stay here for a year, but you will never know what he was suffering. And therefore, always try to be in a position of helping someone who you think may not need help, but they're asking you for help. Do your very, very best to give that help and do what you can. Great. What a great way to end. <laughs> General. Yep. Please join me in thanking General Powell, a great American. We're going to present you. We have a little gift for you. Thank you for what you do for your communities. Uh, without you, we would not have thriving communities in this country of ours. And so just keep it up. And remember, you have to worry about the budget. You have to worry about this, that, and the other. But what you really have to worry about the people you're serving, and you're doing a great job of serving those people. Thank you.